So welcome everybody. My name is Dr Gail Bradbrook. I have a PhD in molecular biophysics. I'm not a current practicing scientist, but I do know off the back of that something about how science is formed in the scientific literature. I'm also part of an organisation called Rising Up. I helped to set it up in 2016. It's a network of something around 5,000 people, about 70 organisers across the UK, and our focus is on non-violent direct action and civil disobedience because we believe they are proven ways for eliciting change. Traditionally, when you're giving talks about climate change, you try and be a little bit hopeful and help people to think about something positive they might do off the back of it. This is quite a different talk. We're going to cover two things. The truth about the ecological crisis that we're in at the moment and the issues of policy making within that and then moving on to how we actually feel about that emotional responses and what we can actually do so the premise of this talk is to tell the truth and ask us all to act accordingly and consistently with the information that's presented to us including our understanding of what actually enables change to happen in the world some of it's hard to hear, and I thought I'd faced this stuff, but I realise I haven't. It's layers, isn't it, with grief, and it's welcome here tonight, permission of your neighbour, but feel free to hold hands, shed tears and so on, or go numb is the typical traditional English way, isn't it? Um, there, and there'll be an opportunity at least to pause for that piece. So the first thing I want to talk about is how do we get useful information from science on climate change? The precautionary principle says that we need to not take big risks. If there's a risk, don't take it. You don't need to know for sure that the risk is going to happen. You just need to know that it's a possibility. And the thing with the climate science is that the information that comes out tends to be quite conservative because of the processes involved. So what a scientist might say down the pub or to a journalist is one thing compared to what they'll say in a single peer-reviewed paper where they try to say exactly what they know within that paper and of course they may have collected the data incorrectly or analysed it wrongly and so you get more rigour by reviewing a specific area of data, getting lots of different data sets, that, that has more rigour in it. And then the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change spends a lot of time looking for consensus across different fields and what the whole area is telling us. And of course, as that becomes more rigorous, it takes more time. Some people feel that IPCC has been deliberately hamstrung uh, through this consensus process. So how then do you deal with the science? There have been some people that have been accused of cherry picking the worst case scenarios and they've been called alarmists. And actually, there seems to be more agreement these days with what the, in quotes, alarmists were saying. So I don't know whether they are right or wrong, but uh, that's not what we intend to do today. We're using the voices of mainstream scientists. On the other hand, the panel three of the IPCC contains economists and policymakers. Many scientists believe it shouldn't even exist. And it is, in the words of Kevin Anderson uh, from the Tyndall Centre, highly politicised. So really what we want to do is find the useful sweet spot to give you the good information. And I think this graph really helps to show the difficulty with the IPCC process. It's the melting of the Arctic sea ice showing the September minimum. And the uh, blue is the range of uh, uh, melting seen from IPCC models. I'm sure they probably updated this recently, but this was where it was at not long ago. And in red, you see the actual observations, the actual data. And of course, science is based on observation. That's what it's about. The data is everything. Um, and the data and the models are way off fundamentally. And this has led, actually, uh, to, especially it seems to be more this year, but uh, in recent times, for some scientists breaking rank, I would say, it's traditionally academia is quite conservative, as I've said. But now you have... Professor Hans Chelnuba, who was the head, who is the head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, senior advisor to the Pope, uh, uh, advisor to Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor and the European Union, a, a credible voice, right? 
And what he's saying is that climate change is now reaching the end game. The issue is the very survival of our civilization. The What Lies Beneath Understatement of Existential Climate Risk paper out this year talks about how climate policy making has become embedded in a culture of failure and scientific reticence. It argues for urgent risk reframe in the climate research and the IPCC report, and it contains voices from some of the world's leading scientists. So let's dig a little bit into the science to look at temperature and tipping points, feedback loops and impacts. Looking more closely at the data from the Arctic, which is the black wiggly line, you have statistical processes where you try and fit uh, a, a line to that data and predict what's going to happen. So this is the September minimum. And basically what the data is telling us, if you, you know, the yellow line's not a good fit, it's a straight line. The other lines that fit better say that the ice will be gone around 2023, the next five years, give or take. I mean, none of this we know until it happens, but that's what we're being told by the data. And obviously it's being updated all the time. The melting creates one uh, example of a worrying feedback loop of climate change. It's called the albedo effect. So when the Arctic sea ice melts, it turns from this white stuff that reflects sunlight back out uh, away from the planet. And instead you have a dark absorbent material that absorbs more heat. It absorbs more heat, it creates temperature rise, more Arctic sea ice melts. It's a feedback. It's called a positive feedback loop. There's nothing good about it because it's positive. So that leads the Yale Climate Connections folks to say climate change is not a matter of cause and effect, it's more like a vicious circle. And so this has moved this year into the idea of abrupt climate change, that there may not be just feedback loops, but sort of domino cascades of feedback loops. Uh, the, the, so it, got tips, it got called the Hot House Earth Paper, the PNAS paper that came out in 2018, and it looked at 10 different feedback loops, permafrost thaw, loss of methane hydrates from the ocean floor, weakening land and ocean carbon sinks, bacterial respiration in the oceans, Amazon dieback, boreal forest dieback, reduction of northern hemisphere snow cover and in other places. And looking at all these different feedback loops suggests that the Earth can tip from just 2 degrees C, which is what the Paris Climate Agreement moves around. At 2 degrees C, it could tip into this hot house Earth state and stay there. So as many scientists have said, 2 degrees C is not a good move. It needs to be 1.5, and that was never a great move either. Um, so this leads one of the authors, Johan Rockström, from the Stockholm Resilience Centre to say, 50 years ago, and I'm sure even five years ago, this would have been dismissed as alarmist, but now scientists have become really worried. Now, when the temperature rises, and you can see the rise in the temperature on the uh, graph from the Met Office, we're at about around one, there's a debate, but around one degree C above pre-industrial levels, and it's rising at about 0.17 a decade, but there's lots of reasons why rises wouldn't be linear. So a Nature paper came out um, recently. It's from the University of Washington, and there was also uh, UN warming estimates that said the idea of holding to two degrees C within the lifetime of people born today is highly unlikely. In fact, it's got, we've got a 1% chance of hitting the one and a half degree target. We've got a 5% chance of hitting less than two degrees. The likely range is between two and almost five, the median is 3.2. You have horrendous consequences at that uh, temperature rise. And they are in the, these temperature rises are in the lifetime of children today. It's catastrophic. This stuff should be on the news every night, right? So the kinds of things that happen is that around 3 degrees C, the Amazon starts to burn down, forests become net carbon producers, not the sinks that they are today, and crops fail. We already will have failure of crops this year, but you'll get massive crop failure when uh, you get rapid uh, desertification and flooding. And 
look at history books about what happens to societies when food fails and, and you get uh, food price spikes. So rising temperatures are causing melting of ice in Greenland and Antarctica. And whereas in the Arctic, because it's sea ice, it doesn't really rise the level of the sea, but these will cause sea level rises and uh, consequently flooding. And in some places, um, cities will be wiped out and uninhabitable. This map shows the places that will be most affected. Um, and many cities are based on rivers or on the coast. Some will be submerged forever. Ever. Others will sustain vast damage and destruction. Alongside other uh, impacts like the desertification, there will be mass migration. There's different models on that. The range is between 100 million and 1 billion people, probably averaging around 200 million. And we're talking by 2050, so when my sons are my age now. Um, this is up to one in nine people on the move. You can't cope with that. Society just cannot cope with that. And uh, I'm afraid it's not a question of Britain shutting down its borders and letting the brown folks drown in the sea because it's an internal migration issue within countries. 10% of the UK population will be affected. Places like Plymouth will be underwater and so on. Um, lots of rural areas. Uh, one, so one in 10 people in the UK affected. So there are other ecological pressures as well as climate change and many of them are related. Ocean acidification is to double by 2100. It's seen as the evil twin of climate change. It's increased by 30% and set to increase by 150% by 2100. 20% of people rely on marine life and nutrition and it's under multiple pressures. Some marine creatures won't actually be able to make their shells and their skeletons anymore and marine life will just simply die off. Um, the oceans are actually the lungs of the earth, possibly even more than the, the trees as far as I understand it. They produce between 50 and 80 percent of the oxygen and consume more than 25 percent of the carbon but it's reliant on a thriving uh, marine ecosystem. We also have air, soil and water pollution and do you know what, if we deal with air pollution climate change gets worse because it's actually apparently scattering uh, some of the light back uh, to the earth so that's a shame. We know about the plastic pollution, particulates and chemicals, the water depletion. Michael Gove actually said that the UK is 30 to 40 years away from a fundamental loss of soil fertility. We know about deforestation and habitat loss. So this led Dr. Marcia McNutt, who's the 22nd president of the National Academy of Sciences in America and former editor-in-chief of the prestigious journal Science, to say in an editorial talking about these cumulative impacts of, of ecological pressures and climate change that even the most optimistic predictions are dire. So, talking specifically about extinction, there have been five major extinctions that scientists can see in the geological record. We hear more about the last one that involved the dinosaurs and was caused by an asteroid strike. There were five others and they were all caused by a very rapid increase in CO2. The most devastating extinction event was called the Permian Triassic. 97% uh, of all life was lost. There was a runaway feedback loop of events which led to the gassing of a planet by hydrogen sulphide. The rate of CO2 emissions today mirrors those of that time and so that we do know that human extinction is a possibility on our current trajectory. We know um, the, the way that mechanism could work. I'm not saying it will, but it, it, it's all possible. So we are already, however, there have been five extinction events. We've already in the sixth mass species ex event the sixth mass species extinction. So you've got scientists using the phrase biological annihilation. Wildlife's dying out due to habitat destruction, overhunting, toxic pollution, alien species and climate change. The ultimate cause of all these factors is overpopulation and specifically overconsumption by the rich.
Species endangered include one in four mammals, one in eight birds, and one, in one third of all amphibians. That's the event that we are already in, and 70% of the world's assessed plants. A 2018 study of British mammals said that one in five could be extinct within a decade. And the latest data on puffins, they're beautiful creatures, aren't they? 33,000 in 2000, in the year 2000, have plummeted to just 570 individuals. I don't personally know how to cope with the grief of all this impact when I think about specific creatures. So remember that we're heading towards around 3 degrees of warming, 3.2, and possibly towards 5. This paper last year was more reported this year, says that there's a 1 in 20 chance that the carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere could cause an existential warming threat. When you go over 5, we just don't know. Um, 3 degrees C is catastrophic by 2050. Again, the lifetime of, of, of children around today, of my children. The author said it's equivalent to a 1 in 20 chance the plane you're about to board will crash. We would never get on that plane with a 1 in 20 chance of it coming down, but we're willing to send our children and grandchildren on that plane. So some humans are more likely to survive, we're good at surviving, but we really have to think about what that means for just a few human beings to survive. I really don't take a great deal of comfort in that. So uh, Professor Jem Bendel is another person who's kind of, I guess, broken ranks with his academic profession and released a paper called Deep Adaptation this year. His take, having reviewed all of the scientific paper, he's a professor of sustainability and leadership at the University of Cumbria, said, societal collapse is inevitable and it's coming soon. Immense catastrophe is very likely. We're talking about massive loss of human life and human extinction is possible. And also just from the previous slide, we're already on a massive extinction of other life. This weekend gone, he presented the latest climate science data. So this is not out in the literature yet, but fundamentally that's what we need to be hearing now on the news every night, what is the current data telling us? And there was a, a great deal of concern that the, there was something happening with the Arctic jet stream that could lead to a collapse within three years' time. It's not guaranteed, but the, the mechanism's there. So all of these conditions, mass migration, crop failures, ongoing disasters, they are the perfect breeding ground for fascism, which is, Adorno said, fear and destructiveness are the major sources of fascism. Authoritarianism and totalitarianism, they're slightly different political forms, none of them are great. We are fond of saying, never again, says Rob Riemann, the founder and president of the Nexus Institute, but the reality is that fascism hijacks democracy over and over and that we're ignoring the warning signs because denial again is more comfortable than facing inconvenient truths. And when you look at this poster of the warning signs of fascism, I suspect you'll agree with me that they're already here. World War II teaches us within living memory lessons about what humans are capable of doing to each other under extreme circumstances. And this uh, ecological crisis goes off the scale of extreme circumstances. So here's a quote about the Soviet prisoners of war in 1941 from Bloodlands by T Timothy Snyder. When the German army transported Soviet prisoners of war by train, it used open freight cars with no protection from the weather. When the trains reached their destinations, hundreds or sometimes even thousands of frozen corpses would tumble from the open doors. Death rates during transportation were as high as 70%. Perhaps 200,000 prisoners died in these death marches and death transports. In 1941, those who could not work saw their official rations cut by 27%. This was for many prisoners a purely theoretical reduction, since in many prisoners of war camps no one was fed on a regular basis, and in most the weaker had no access to food anyway. A remark of the quartermaster general of the German army made explicit the policy of starvation. Those prisoners who could not work, he said, are to be starved. Across the camps, prisoners ate whatever they could find, grass, bark, pine needles. They had no meat unless a dog was shot. 
A few prisoners got horse meat on a few occasions. Prisoners fought and lick utensils while their German guards laughed at their behaviour. When cannibalism began, the Germans presented it as the result of the low level of Soviet civilizations. The Germans shot on a conservative estimate half a million Soviet prisoners of war. By way of starvation or mistreatment during transit, they killed about 2.6 million more. All in all, perhaps 3.1 million Soviet prisoners of war were killed. And then four years later, when Russians marched into Germany, two million women were raped. Some women were raped between 60 and 70 times. When society gets into a state of horrendously immoral behaviour, terrible things happen. So this is a blog that came out this year um, from Douglas Rushcott. He's the Professor of Media Theory and Digital Economics. Uh, the picture in the corner is a an attempt at a human biosphere where you get to live outside the, outside the earth. And he said, uh, survival of the rich richest, the wealthy are plotting to leave us behind. Last year I got invited to a super deluxe private resort to deliver a keynote speech to what I assumed would be a hundred or so investment bankers. It was by far the largest fee I had ever been offered for a talk, about half my annual professor's salary all to deliver some insight on the subject of the future technology, the future of technology. My audience was brought to me, five super wealthy guys, yes all men, from the upper echelon of the hedge fund world. After a bit of small talk, I realised they had no interest in the information I had prepared about the future of technology. They had come with questions of their own. Which region will be less impacted by the coming climate crisis, New Zealand or Alaska? And finally, the CEO of a brokerage house explained that he had nearly completed building his own underground bunker system and asked, how do I maintain authority over my security force after the event? They knew armed guards would be required to protect their compounds from the angry mobs. But how would they pay the guards once money was worthless? What would stop the guards from choosing their own leader? The billionaires cons considered using special combination locks on the food supply that only they knew or making the guards wear disciplinary collars of some kind in return for their survival, or maybe building robots to serve as guards and workers, if that technology could be developed in time. Now, the phrase, the event, is the name that the elite are giving to the breakdown of society. They are anticipating it, but even they feel powerless to do anything about it. It's talked about a lot. So there are many detailed things that... Um, written about changes that could and need to be made, but we all seem to be in some kind of mental herding effect. Well, how is government responding to these terrible threats to our nation? UK policy, government policy is utterly terrible. For example, they have scrapped um, support for onshore wind, axed solar subsidies, killed off the flagship green home scheme, sold off the Green Investment Bank, watered down the incentive to buy a greener car, given up on zero carbon homes, ditched the green tax target and refused tidal power. And to mention two specifics, the approval of the third runway at Heathrow will increase the airport's emissions by 7.3 million tonnes. That's the carbon equivalent of Cyprus. Fracking is tax subsidised. We know that it actually increases global methane emissions, methane being a far worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So the worst period for UK environmental policy in 30 years. So we just have to really face uh, reality, folks. There is a horrendous lack of concrete action. The graph on the left shows you the increase in greenhouse gases. When the first IPCC report came out in 1990, 28 years ago, the UN warned us then to keep temperature rises to one degree C or face societal collapse. CO2 levels are 60% higher than in 1990 and they're still rising, methane even more so. At some point soon, maybe it's already here, we can't reverse the problems, they run away from us. So we have to conclude that conventional approaches to dealing with climate change have failed to deal with the problem on two levels. Governments have failed to introduce the large-scale changes that are only in their power to implement and environmental organisations have failed to put enough pressure on governments to introduce these changes. It interests me to know how the international community managed to carry on with business as usual, 
Basically, it's based on this myth that we're going to create a technology called carbon capture and storage. It's been tried in small trials. It's not worked um, and it, 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 it's not ready to scale. There's been a review. So it would be great to have a technology and I, I'm all out for it, but it's, there aren't currently safe. Um, we're not against safe, innovative technological solutions, but they need to stand alongside concrete actions today based on things that we know will work. So this is Professor Kevin Anderson. He's the Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester and Deputy Director of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, talking about governments and uh, their role in doing nothing. He said there have been a litany of technocratic frauds. We haven't tried real mitigation. It's not that things can't be done right. Long-term targets undermine real mitigation today. Policy makers are relying on negative emission technologies that don't exist. There's always going to be a silver bullet for the future. We'd rather question physics than the economic model. Scientists are reluctant to say how challenging the Paris commitments are, and they are self-censoring. So this is Dr. Kate Marvel from the NASA's Goddard Institute. She researches humanity's effect on climate and what we can expect in the future. And she says, to be a climate scientist is to be an active participant in a slow motion horror story. We are inevitably sending our children to live on an unfamiliar planet. As a climate scientist, I am often asked to talk about hope, particular, particularly in the current political climate. Audiences want to be told that everything will be all right in the end. Climate change is bleak, the organisers always say. Tell us a happy story. Give us, a, give us hope. The problem is, I don't have any. She goes on to say that hope is a creature of privilege. We know that things will be lost, but it's comforting to believe that others will bear the brunt of it. But the opposite of hope is not despair, it's grief. Even while resolving to limit the damage, we can mourn. And here, the sheer scale of the problem provides a perverse comfort. We are in this together. The swiftness of the change, its scale and inevitability binds us into one. Broken hearts trapped together under a warming atmosphere. We need courage, not hope. Grief, after all, is the cost of being alive. We are all fated to live lives shot through with sadness and we are not worth less for it. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. So I'm just going to pause for a couple of minutes to let that sink in before we move on to the next part. So let's just breathe a few times, everybody, <laughs> while we can. So what, what do we do in the face of this? What responses, emotional and practical? I mean, how does this existential threat affect you? How does it affect the way you wish to live your life? So Stephen Jenkinson talks about our death-phobic culture. My understanding is that our dying times are an opportunity to really live well if we pay attention to how precious life is. That we come to peace when we understand that life is far bigger than any of us as individuals. We can understand our role in the service of, of life as we join a line of worthy ancestors, those that weren't before us 
and we make our lives about honouring and protecting those that come after us. In, Indo in indigenous cultures, they talk about uh, protecting the next seven generations. In the age of ecological meltdown, when our children's future is currently set to an unimaginable catastrophe, it's our job to really allow ourselves to feel the grief and then ask how we intend to act. And I think it's a big thing to decide to face the grief of this and not turn away from it. It's a, it's a courageous thing to do in itself. This is a big shift in our consciousness. It's one that moves away from the very deeply embedded narcissistic culture of consumerism that I'm sure we're all uh, embedded in, where we ask, what do I need? How can I feel better? How do I hang on to privilege for myself and my family? It moves towards accepting that this is a time of grief, but that we can still appreciate beauty. We can still keep ourselves in good shape for the task required of us. It asks us to step into service and be willing to do the things that might just make a difference. It asks us to make sacrifices. This is a big emotional shift and actually I think it's really liberating. So we need a new approach in the face of this failure. We need the world's governments to introduce a World War II style mobilisation. The American economy was transformed in a matter of a few months to deal with existential threat. I'm not going to go into details, but the kinds of things it would involve are reducing carbon emissions, of course, reducing demand, a massive investment in safe ways of taking carbon out of the atmosphere, transport, regenerative agriculture, restoring ecosystems. It's all technologically and economically possible and in a short space of time. Solutions are there, right? The absolute key issue is how do you create enough political pressure? It's up to us to create that political will and there are tried and tested techniques for doing that. So we're talking about the need for civil disobedience that escalates into a rebellion and uprising. The good news is it doesn't actually need that many people, which gives everyone in this room, everyone who hears this talk, an immense opportunity to do something amazing. We're talking about needing a few hundred people, not two million people to go on a march, right? Would you be one of those few hundred people? So when people hear something frightening, the conventional wisdom is that they uh, will get paralysed and, and turn away from the subject, which is why, as I said earlier, climate change has been based on lying, talking about climate change in the past, because we didn't want people to turn away, we wanted them to do something. So that's the process of being a bystander. Something's causing you fear, so find a way to get rid of facing the fear. However, a small percentage of people are what are known as upstanders. And so the aim of this talk is to try and find upstanders, and you can choose to be an upstander. And our approach in Rising Up is based on the belief that some smaller group of upstanding people will not only be willing to act, but will, but will be willing to do what it takes. So let's talk a little bit about ethics. You know, if you do a bad thing, if you, plan, if you plan a terrible thing, you get punished, right? If you punish someone in the face, you'll get a fine. If you plan to blow up a building, you'll go to prison. There's a progression to wrongdoing. Again, Nazi Germany, use of toxic gas to kill its Jewish population was horrendous. And those Nazis that survived the war faced the Nuremberg trials and they went to prison. But what if they planned to gas cities across the world? Their crime would have been even worse. Or suppose they wanted to gas an entire country or even the whole world. The reality is that the levels of CO2 being pumped into our atmosphere based on policies that governments are behind is planned, it's willful and it will kill millions of people. So in Rising Up we're saying that climate change is not a political issue, it's an issue of morality. What's happening is bad, it's evil and it has to be stopped. And that when a government does something that is horrendously immoral, it has to be challenged. And that's regardless of your political choice. There's a political spectrum. It doesn't matter where you lie on that. We probably understand the left wing and the idea of rebellion on the left wing. But political theorists across the political spectrum agree that rebellion is justified once the establishment fails. John Locke is a liberal. 
he termed what political philosophers call the right of revolution, when a government fails to protect the lives and livelihoods of their citizens, as in the case of climate change, the people have the right to rebel. Thomas Hobbes is a conservative. He spoke about the social contract, where the state derives and loses its authority based on its willingness and ability to main, maintain order and security for its people. The Second Amendment in the US is also based in this principle. So we're asking people to act as if the information presented tonight is real and take appropriate responses. Now, the conventional approach to tackling issues involves awareness raising, leafleting, lobbying, send emails to your MP, build a collective demand, go on a march, get a petition together. These approaches are appropriate for relatively small political issues like an unwanted housing development and for the early stages of raising an alarm about a specific issue but they are not appropriate for issues that are existential and urgent. I'm not saying they shouldn't happen at all, but if that's the plan, it's not going to work. There are powerful political and economic interests involved that stop necessary change from happening. So in these cases, an appropriate response requires high-stake, disruptive civil disobedience and non-violent sacrificial action. And just to talk about it in, in some summary, the actions have to be disruptive, they have to disrupt major cities, which gets the attention of political decision makers. You've got lots of examples of that in the past. In the recent past, a really good example is how um, the gay rights movement got the attention of everybody to change the way that AIDS was being researched and dealt with. And what they did was super disruptive. And basically, when you're disruptive, people say, well, I agree with what you're saying, but I don't like how you're doing it. And the point is they're talking about it. So the disruption is just unfortunate. It needs to be sacrificial. We've had people going on hunger strike in our actions. And uh, the, the, the willingness to go to jail is what makes observers sympathetic. So much in humanity is about emotion, right? It's not about what you say, how you persuade people with arguments. It's about how people feel. And when they can see how serious you are about a cause, then it wakes people up. You can use a process of backfiring. Opponents tend to respond to direct action with some form of repression, arresting people and so on, and it shows them in a bad light to observers who are therefore more likely to join in. But it's also respectful. Opponents are treated with respect. It's absolutely non-violent. Non-violence is morally and materially functional. In fact, you don't, you're not as successful if you use violence. There's lots of data on that. So non-violent civil disobedience has a strong grounding in history. Um, you know of these people, the obvious ones, Luther King, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. Uh, in the bottom corner there's James Hansen. He's the preeminent grandfather of climate science, right? He's been arrested uh, in, in honour of the cause and there's a polar bear also getting arrested and Caroline Lucas at a fracking site. Its efficacy is well known. What I find is that people like it in the past, but they don't like it so much in the present. So here's the plan. Um, the Extinction Rebellion is planning an uprising against the British government starting this November. Following the declaration on the 31st of October, we're doing talks across the UK like this one and asking people to join us. There will be a declaration action in London and for those that um, choose there will be things that you can do that will get you arrested. From November the 12th there will be ongoing civil disobedience uh, leading to short jail time for some and the purpose of this is to move the Overton window which I'll talk about in a moment. In March there will be an escalation in the UK and an internationalisation of the rebellion. We're making contact with people in other countries. And the idea is to repeat these periods of action as needed and organising in between. Look, folks, it's an incredible long shot, but I don't know of another plan that makes sense to me. So the Overton window you may have heard of is a phrase referring to what's seen as normal and acceptable part of the mainstream of public discussion of issues. The debate in the popular press about climate change, but thank God about hearing about the BBC changing their minds around this stuff, but it tends to be limited to the fact that it will be a substantial cost, not talking about it being the utter catastrophe that it's going to be. 
and it doesn't reflect reality. So disruptive and unexpected behaviour can change the Overton window. Trump and Brexit have managed to move the Overton window to a place where upfront racism becomes normalised, whereas a few years ago we couldn't have imagined an American president caging children and talking about banning Muslims. So we want the reality of the ecological threat to be a mainstream discussion for people to know how bad a state we are leaving the world in for our children. So it's not for future generations which can sound some time away, not so imminent and somehow a bit unreal. The first step of the rebellion is to shift this Overton window. It will probably require something like 50 to 100 people to go to jail and of order a thousand arrests. In fact, we've been told by a major publication 50 people in jail will get us a front cover. Now, it turns out beyond that that you only need between 1% and 3% of a population to be mobilised to bring about massive social change or the fall of a regime. This is data from Eric Chenoweth. It's only 2 million people in the UK. So the Egyptian revolution had only a million people in Takriya Square, or, despite the fact there were 20 million people living in the Greater Cairo area and the country has a population of around 90 million. So there isn't a need for the people to rise up, it's just for some of us. And some of us have got to lead the edge, we've got to lead the way. We don't know, of course, the exact figures, but we can look to historical examples. So Martin Luther King and the American Civil Rights Movement didn't bring about any change, particularly through using conventional approaches. From the mid-50s, they took to direct action campaigns, and that brought about significant changes. It involved several hundred people going to prison and several thousand arrests, so it gives us a benchmark. These are the Freedom Riders. They were black and white people that went on buses in the southern parts of the USA to break the bus station segregation policy. It started with just 25 students. So just double who's in this room, right? And it ended with around 300 people in prison by the end of the summer, and it caused a fundamental change in policy. If it takes 300 people in jail in America, what does it take in the UK? So we think we probably need about 2 million people in active support, so lots of people can be behind the scenes fundraising, supporting, not everybody has to go to jail, but that is useful. Um, it might be 5,000 people willing to do civil disobedience or, say, 500 people in jail. What we do know is the more high stake the action is, the fewer people are needed to create the desired change. And to begin is the most important next step. So in Rising Up, we want to use this more effective approach and we are mobilising to get people together to ask them if they're willing to take this action with us. We've done 30 talks already, we've got 20 more in the pipeline and more to come. I just want to give you really briefly a feeling of who we are and what we've been up to. We're really nice people. <laughs> um, here's us chalk spraying Barclays Bank. Uh, we did a number of actions across the UK. At the same time as Friends of the Earth were doing stalls and some of us were doing petitions and Barclays agreed to divest from Third Energy, the fracking company. Here's us closing down partially Heathrow Airport twice about the runway issue. So one of the things people get worried about is if you've offended once and you offend again, maybe you'll be in, in lots of trouble. It's called breaking a conditional di discharge. So the person laying down in front of the car had been involved in breaking a conditional discharge and he was given a £25 fine because I think the judge totally got why he was doing it. And at the time they were asked um, why, by the barrister, why didn't you, you know, organise a protest? Of course we had organised a protest and of course it got zero coverage. And the, um, one of the people involved, uh, actually somebody in the room here was one of the people involved, um, one of the people involved had organised a march of 25,000 people in, in Toronto and said this action involving five people got much more coverage than a 25,000 person march. Here's a solidarity action, some of the people in the room here as well, uh, action that we did uh, with disabled people against cuts and the way we organise is that people can do whatever protest they like, they just need to uh, agree to our principles and values which obviously include things like uh, non-violence. This is us the uh, day before the election 
uh, the recent election and we went to Rupert Murdoch's headquarters, we used this spray chalk again, it, it actually washes off really quickly so it took us 10 minutes, we sprayed the building, we filmed it, we put it on, on YouTube and we cleaned it off afterwards. The police actually said to us, um, well they found it quite funny basically, uh, and and for 10 minutes uh, action, the uh, action got 170,000 views. So that's an example of of, of doing something quite s small and quick and, and, and not needing a big investment of time. So what we really uh, look at data and, and um, reflect on what we're doing. And for some of us, there's quite a prayerful element to this work as well. So we've been about trying to break the mould of ordinary campaigning. This is about air pollution in London, the Stop Killing Londoners campaign. And there was a deliberate uh, process of going to jail here. And what that involves is breaking um, bail conditions and you go on remand and you're out in a week. So people here, four people went to jail for a week and they've written us a nice booklet about it so we know what we've got coming. Um, and what we've discovered from four people going to jail is that it gets you a meeting with Tadi Khan's chief policy officer. So that's the data on that. In this action, this was about cleaners in uh, the London School of Economics, which likes to think it's a nice lefty and right on organisation. The cleaners were being treated terribly to the point they had to sleep with a boss to get a shift, really bad paying conditions. Uh, and they went on strike and there was basically these actions led by three uh, white men, the cleaners were all black people um, and the white guys said we will go to jail, this is outrageous and they kept doing this repeat civil disobedience and this is poster paint on the floor, it washes off. Uh, it got to a point where Noam Chomsky intervened and made a, a point about it and the LSC just stopped these people getting arrested and the cleaners won their strike. We've been about normalising civil disobedience. This was something really fun we did in April. We did a mass trespass on the Bathurst estate in Sirencester. We went marching in with, a, with the red band. We were very polite with Bathurst. We had to chat about their tax affairs on Facebook afterwards. It's, um, we, we're not about blaming and shaming people. And uh, everybody really enjoyed it. It feels really different actually, going on a march and just going around in a circle feels really different when you break the law, especially when you get away with it. It's really good fun, <laughs> I'm honest, at times. I mean, there's a lot of admin organising it. So this divestment campaign, there'd been a divestment campaign at King's College for two years. Uh, this, uh, and basically it's the usual run around by bu bureaucracy. Oh, well, yes, you've got a point, come to our meeting, we'll set up a committee, we'll get a report, we'll have a meeting about the report. Two years of, of, of time wasted, right? You know the deal. An escalated campaign of civil disobedience won that campaign in eight weeks. It involved Roger Hallam here uh, being um, thrown out of the university twice. He's doing a PhD on how things change and he went on hunger strike. <laughs> He's doing a PhD on how to screw over his own institution. It's quite funny. Um, after eight weeks, they agreed to all demands and they won. And then the process was copied in Cardiff University. They won and in Bristol. So, final slide. So, we talked in the beginning of this talk about dire future prospects. Is there any hope? Is it even worth trying? Well, yes, we've shown you that there are solutions. There is something worth trying. It's ambitious, but it is at least feasible. But in some ways, the question's wrong, and it's become a bit of a habit in Western countries. There's two influential schools in the history of ethics. Utilitarianism, which is where you do something wanting an outcome. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but to an extent, it's better to look at virtue ethics, which asks us, what makes me a good human being? What does it mean to live a good life in these times? And in this tradition, it's practical wisdom. It's our heart that leads and precedes the actions and decisions. So it's always worth doing something if it's morally good and the right thing to do, no matter how successful we'll be. And that's where we're at in rising up with this. This is what we're about. And just to quote Dr. Kate Marvel again, courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. We're talking about traditional values here, orientated towards service to community, duty, responsibility, honour, and the desire to be a worthy ancestor. 
in fully understanding that we will die one day, it could be soon, wishing to fully live a meaningful life, and in facing the risk of life on earth dying, to step forwards and be willing to offer our service to something bigger than ourselves, to life, to life itself. For some, this is a basic orientation of their spiritual expression, the part of ourselves that understands what's sacred. So I'm asking you to take a minute to ask yourself, given what I just heard, what does it mean for me to be a good human? What does it mean to die without regrets? Will you be able to look your grandchildren in the eye and say you did what you could?